Okay, well, now we go on to the next speaker. That's another of our regulars, Tony Seidler, <coughs> who's somewhere over there. Good. And uh, I have the title of his talk. It's called The Stars Like Dust Isaac Asimov's 1950s Science Fiction Classic. Now, that's Robin's we'll conjecture. What that... Oh, was it? I'll do a conjecture at <laughs> the end, but we'll see what that's all about. Do you know how to control this one? No. Oh, right. Anyway, Tony. Yes. We'll tell you what. Jerry, do you want to say your piece now? And then. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, because it's only going to be two minutes after. Yeah. While we get this set up. So, Jerry's got, just going to point out that it's a bit of a sort of uh, anniversary at the moment, a few key events. Um, some sad anniversaries, in fact. Um, the 27th of January, 1967, as many of you will know was the date of the Apollo 1 fire. And January 28, 1986 was the loss of the Space Shuttle Challenger and February 2nd, 2003 was the loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia. So it is uh, a sad time of the year for us. Um, Gus Grissom, the commander of Apollo 1, said we are in a risky business and we hope that if anything happens to us, it will not delay the space program. The conquest of space is worth the risk of life. Now, coincidentally, January the 27th, 1967, was also the date that the UN Treaty on Outer Space was published. So this is the 50th anniversary. So I'd just like to mention briefly that the British Interplanetary Society is holding a special evening about this next Tuesday the 31st. If anyone wants more details about that, come and see me after the meeting. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. And now, the main event is Tony with the Isaac Asimov classic, The Stars Like Dust. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I can't see anyone out there, but I'm sure there's somebody around somewhere. Uh, when you look up into the <coughs> night sky on a summer's evening, preferably somewhere where there aren't any street lights, you get a beautiful view of the Milky Way. And that is the largest structure in the sky. It stretches right round the sky. And it's not surprising really that our ancestors wondered just what on earth it was. Well, now we know what it is, don't we? It's a galaxy. But do we really appreciate what it's all about? Our galaxy contains 200,000 million stars. And it's 100,000 light years across. And each light year is 9 million million kilometers. Have you taken all those numbers in? Because they are rather large. And the trouble with numbers like that is that you finish up with a great string of zeros. And you've got to be very careful when you count those zeros, because if you get them wrong, you've made a mistake in at least a factor of 10. When in those numbers I just mentioned to you, there's 27 zeros. 28 zeros. See what I mean? So you've got to be very, very careful. And in order to appreciate just how big our Milky Way is, we really need some sort of model. Here's our Milky Way, 100,000 light years across. The sun is about 27,000 light years from the centre. And the galaxy disk is about 1,000 light years thick. How are we going to model all of that? Well, I'm sure you've met some sort of astronomical model before, probably one where you were shown the scale of the solar system. And if you want to see a model solar system, all you need to do is to go down to Otford, which is a village in Kent near Seven Oaks, and there they've got a model solar system on their playing field. Here we are. You have a ball which represents the sun, and here we have the planets spaced around. They're spaced around where they were on the 1st of January 2000. And it gives you an idea of the scale of the solar system when you realize that Pluto is up there, which is an awful long walk away. Yes, it was a planet, or at least it was considered to be a planet in 2000, so it's on there. But it's quite a model. 
There we see some people having a picnic just outside the asteroid belt. <laughs> the one planet you may not find is Mars, because this is a playing field, and Mars, well, when they have had a cricket match, squarely get falling over Mars, so they had to make Mars removable, and I think they'll supply it for you if you want. You have to go and get it and put it on yourself. <laughs> I made a model like this when I was teaching. I started off with a foot ball. A foot ball. It's a foot across, that's why it's called a football, isn't it? I mean, would you want to go and watch a game of 30 centimetre ball? Probably not. <laughs> so this football was donated to the science department. I lived in a house on the school grounds, and one day it arrived in the front garden, and he only donated it to us, which was nice of him. I told him he could have it back after we'd finished with it, but he wasn't too keen on the idea. Most of it was something to do with the fact that it was now bright yellow, I don't know. But when we got ready to go out, what we had to do was take our football, and we'd then get a few beads, polystyrene beads, out of the drawers of the science lab, and the class would get together, and off we'd go. Mind you, we had to sort out a few bickerings before we went. You can imagine, can't you? I want to carry Jupiter, no, I'm carrying Jupiter. Oh, dear, oh, dear. My planet's bigger than your planet. I was told there were 11-year-olds, but the way they were behaving, I'm sure there were more like 15. <laughs> So you set off down the field carrying your planets, and you dump planets at suitable intervals down the field. And when you come back, you pick them all up, and that's a class taken care of for the afternoon. It saves planning a lesson. I thought we could do the same sort of thing with a galaxy. And I thought the other day that I might be saved the problem of actually working it out. Because I was walking past an industrial estate, and there was a, a warehouse which had on the wall an advert for solar systems. And I thought, good, well, I'll go <laughs> see if we've got any galaxies. And I got to the door, and I suddenly realised this was a heating engine. Here. <laughs> so I had to make up the idea myself. Now, obviously, we can't do it the same way as we did with the solar system, because whereas the sun and nine or eight now planets is not too difficult to distribute amongst the class, what are you going to do with 200,000 million stars? You're not going to get them all back, are you? So it's going to be a real problem. 200,000 million, by the way. If you were to take the population of London, and I don't know exactly what the population of London is, eight it's estimated to be somewhere around 8, 9 or 10 million. I guess the way they work it out is they do what astronomers do when they try to count the number of galaxies. You take a piece of sky and you measure the number of galaxies in that piece of sky, and then you multiply up the areas to get out the idea of how many galaxies there are in the whole sky. I thought you could do the same thing with London. You take a small area of London and count the number of people in it, you multiply it by the area of London, and you should get the total population. However, when I thought about doing this on the Jubilee Line train, I came here on this afternoon, I think that 10 million is a considerable underestimate. <laughs> so, let's say about 10 million people in London. If you were to take those 10 million people and give them all a star on the day they were born, and then the next day you give them all another star, and another star the next day, and so on, by the time they reach retirement age, you've given out about the number of stars in our galaxy. That gives you an idea of just how many stars there are in our galaxy. So, we're going to make a model of a galaxy. We can't do it the way we did with the planets, but we often talk about a galaxy being a city of stars. So I thought, well, why not use a city to model our galaxy? Which city? Well, we're in London. I'm sure you're all familiar with the geography of London. You all got here, after all, so you must be, mustn't you? <laughs> Those who didn't make it here and are watching on video can now pause this presentation while they go off and find themselves a map. So there we've got London from space. And the first thing is, well, what are you going to count as London? The city of London, officially, is a square mile. But I don't think that's going to be much use because I'm not certain that we all know that much geography of the city of London. So, let's try the conurbation of London. Many people will tell you that London is bounded by the M25, but it's not. 
If you drive around the M25 next time, and you're sitting in the back seat of your car having a meal, waiting for the traffic to clear, you might like to look around you, and you'll see that you're driving, or rather you're stationary, in open countryside. The M25 is well outside London. So, what about the built-up area of London? How about that? Well, that's not going to work, because London is always expanding. I don't think it's anything to do with the expansion of the universe, but it might be. <laughs> Every time a cabbage patch near the edge of London becomes vacant, a property developer moves in, suddenly you've got to serve a new housing estate. So you can't just use the built-up area. But something which hasn't changed much over the last 70 years or so is the area of the London postal districts. That's the area where your postcode starts with an N or with an SE or something like that. That's been fixed for about the last 70 years, and that has a diameter of about 70, about 20 miles. Now London's a bit ragged at the edges, don't worry about that, so are galaxies. Here we've got a picture of a galaxy which is distinctly ragged at the edges. If we take our 20 mile diameter postal area of London, that's what we get. So what we need to do now is to think about putting the galaxy on there. I've put a few towns in, and I've got more towns around this area than I have around this area, for reasons which will become apparent later on. Charing Cross is generally considered to be the centre of London, that's where all the measurements are made when you measure distances to other towns, and Charing Cross will do where we put the centre of our galaxy. Charing Cross is here, just outside Charing Cross Station. It was built on the orders of Henry I to commemorate his dead wife, Eleanor. They brought Eleanor's coffin back by a funeral procession from Lincoln to London, and they built these crosses every time they stopped for the night. So <coughs> some people think that, well, the reason they put it out here is that when they got off the train, that was where the train arrived. <coughs> this is obvious nonsense, because trains from Charing Cross don't go to Lincoln, they go to the Coast. <laughs> and anyway, the Eleanor Cross was not originally outside Charing Cross Station. Originally, it was in what is now Trafalgar Square, at the top of Whitehall. But after 1805, they wanted something else to be planted there, so they had to move Eleanor's Cross, and they made it. It was rather a nasty looking thing, but it's there now. So there we have the city of London, 20 miles across. Now, I hope you're familiar with miles. I know many people these days insist on metric units, like kilometres, but if you're going to be an astronomer, you've got to get used to these different units of length, because astronomers will often use miles, or yards, or feet, or inches, or kilometres, or metres, or nanometers, or angstrom units, not to mention light years or parsecs. So there's an awful lot of units of length involved in astronomy. Indeed, one of the main numbers in astronomy is the Hubble parameter. And that tells you something about the rate at which the universe is expanding. And the units of the Hubble parameter? Kilometers per second per mega parsec. So there you've got two units of length in one unit. And if that's not messing around with the units, I don't know what it is. So there we've got our 20 mile diameter of London, representing the 100,000 light years of the galaxy. And if you work that out, it comes out at about one foot for each light year. I'm not going to go through the maths with you, because you all have trains to catch, so you work it out for yourselves when you get home. So, but the sun is 27,000 light years from the centre, and that is about five and a half miles. Where we put the sun, of course, depends on how we rotate the galaxy relative to the city. So, when I looked at the map, I discovered that there was a convenient point, five and a half miles from Charing Cross. This was Greenwich, which I thought was very convenient, because it would save me having to commute. So we put the sun in Greenwich. The centre of the galaxy, Charing Cross, the sun, Greenwich. How thick is the galaxy? A thousand light years. That's about a thousand feet. But the galaxy is a fairly flat affair, so we can do a map of the galaxy on the two-dimensional surface of London. You have to remember, though, that stars will be anything up to about 500 feet above or below the ground, but 
but there you've got the ground going up and down anyway, so that's not too much of a problem. What about neighbouring galaxies, just to see how that works out? Well, we've put the Milky Way in London, and the nearest galaxies to ours, nearest galaxies anyone's heard of to ours, are the two Magellanic Clouds, and we can put those in Luton and Harlow. They be about the right sort of size and the right sort of distance from London. And the next biggest gallery, galaxy is Messier 31, the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, we don't have a city big enough for that on the map, <coughs> but it would be more or less where Edinburgh is. Gives you an idea of the distance between galaxies. So our galaxy is pretty big, but the universe itself is much, much larger. <coughs> so there we've got Greenwich, with the sun in Greenwich. There's the neighbouring areas. Where is the sun? Well, specifically, it's in the Royal Observatory. I don't know how familiar you are with the geography of the Royal Observatory. If you're not familiar with the geography of the Royal Observatory, you jolly well should be. We are open every day of the year, except for one or two bank holidays, and you can come along, and there are classes which take place in the classrooms there. There are telescope events, where the 28-inch Great Equatorial Telescope is available for public viewing, and we also have a very nice planetarium there where your speaker would be this afternoon if he wasn't giving a talk to the Society for Popular Astronomy. So do come along to visit Greenwich. It is well worth the visit. So we're going to put the sun in the classroom where I teach GCS Astronomy in the south building of the Royal Observatory. We need to know which way we are looking. Now here we've got Greenwich marked and we've got the directions marked. We're showing you the directions of various constellations. Don't you imagine that the ends of those arrows show you where the constellations are, because the constellations are not physical places you can go to. Constellations are stars, very often at different distances from the Earth, which just make up a convenient pattern because of the place we're looking from. Go to somewhere else in the universe, you wouldn't see the same constellations. So when we say that the centre of the galaxy lies in the constellation of Sagittarius, we're really stretching the point a bit. What we mean is that if you look at the direction of Sagittarius, there you will see the centre of the galaxy well beyond any of the stars which make up the constellation. We tend to use latitude and longitude on the Earth to find our way around. We use right ascension and declination in the sky to find our way around. We can use a similar set of coordinates to make up what we call galactic coordinates. Galactic longitude is measured around the galactic equator, which is the disk of the galaxy. Galactic latitude is measured at right angles to the direction around the disk, and at 90 degrees you will finish up at the north celestial pole or the south celestial pole. We have therefore latitude in the galaxy quite easily established. But longitude is another matter, because as you're probably aware, aware on Earth, longitude is measured from an arbitrary point, it's measured from Greenwich, because that's where the maps were all drawn with zeros, so that's where the normal longitude is measured from. In the galaxy, the obvious place to measure longitude from is from the centre of the galaxy. So here we are on the Sun, looking towards the centre of the galaxy, and that's going to be galactic longitude zero, and we'll measure to the left or east, and that will give us the 90 degrees, 180 degrees, which is directly opposite the galaxy center, 270 degrees back to the center. Notice this is not quite the same as ordinary longitude on the Earth, which will be measured from the center of the Earth. Longitude on the galaxy is not measured from the center of the galaxy, it's measured from the sun. So the whole thing is a little odd in that respect. So here we are with galactic longitudes marked, naught pointing towards Charing Cross, and naught is around here, and then we've got 45, 90 degrees at right angles, then we've got 180 degrees pointing away from the central galaxy, 270 degrees pointing up here, and that gives us galactic longitude measurements. The galaxy is rotating that way. When you look at the galaxy, this is an artist's impression, it looks as though it ought to be rotating that way, doesn't it? because that's the way the spiral arms trail. And we believe that in most cases, spiral galaxies do rotate with their spiral arms trailing, although there is some question that maybe that's not true in every case. 
Well, the first thing we ought to go and look at, I suppose, is the black hole at the centre of the galaxy. Seeing that from here is very difficult because there's things in the way. Seeing Eleanor's Cross from Greenwich is also very difficult because there's things in the way. In the galaxy, it's clouds of gas and dust and things like that. In London, it's buildings and trees, but it still makes it difficult. But we can go to Charing Cross in order to see the black hole at the centre of the galaxy. Where is it? It's going to be on Eleanor, and it's not very often realised that Eleanor was in fact a multiple personality. So there are many different Eleanors arranged around Eleanor's cross. Where is the black hole? Well, I thought it would be a good idea to put it on one of the Eleanor's noses. I like the idea of a medieval queen with a black head on her nose. I don't know. It's there. Can you see it? No. Because on this scale, the black hole at the centre of the galaxy, which contains four million times the mass of the sun, is less than half a millimetre across. And yet all the mass in that black hole goes towards regulating what goes on in the central region of the black hole and also contributes quite a lot towards the way in which stars move around the centre of the galaxy. So that tiny black hole, which we can't even see on this picture, is ruling the inner part of our <coughs> galaxy. So we've got the sun situated in the classroom here, and there I've drawn a 30 light year radius sphere. And in that 30 light year radius sphere, I think we've got a magnifier of it, there we are, we have star stars which you will recognise the names of at least. And I've only put first magnitude stars on there. Problem, it is a sphere, not a circle. In our region of the galaxy, stars are invisible in every direction. Remember, it's a thousand feet thick. So there will be stars above us and below us and on all sides, which is why the sky is full of stars in all directions. I haven't put any of the fainter stars on there, though I know it's more, because they're just catalogue numbers. Most of the stars in the sky are very much smaller and very much fainter than the sun. They're what are called red dwarfs. And the nearest red dwarf is a satellite of Alpha Centauri. And yet it's so faint, you need a fairly large pair of binoculars or a small telescope in order to see it. And if that's just about visible, and it's the closest one to the sun, the rest of these red dwarfs really you can't see. If we go up to 100 light years, then once again we've got stars scattered all over the sky. I've only put on here the stars which lie in the galactic plane, because a star which is above the sun is obviously going to appear in the wrong position as far as distance goes. So for 100 light years, most of the stars you can see with the unaided eye lie within that 100 light year sphere. And if we go still further, 200 light years, we can then shift <coughs> magnification. Now you can see the rest of the Royal Observatory. We're in Greenwich Park, by the way. And now we've got a 1,000 light year sphere which stretches over most of Greenwich Park. It just pokes out a little bit here at the Royal Naval College. But nowhere here does it come out of Greenwich Park or Blackheath. And the 2,000 light year sphere, well, it doesn't even come out of Blackheath. That's what it looks like if we go back to the original magnification of the whole city. There's our 2,000 light, 2, light year radius sphere. Just about every star you can see at night lies within that sphere. And altogether, we think there are probably around 200,000 stars in there. So that little sphere is about as far as we can see. And all this out here, the rest of our galaxy, is largely unknown. So what about all those structures we've drawn on there? Well. Spiral galaxies have spiral arms, and we have spiral arms in our galaxy, and we tried to label them to a certain extent. This is one set of labels. We lie here in what is called the Orion Spur, which is junction here with the Sagittarius arm, which is the arm which passes through the constellation of Sagittarius, apparently, and it's named after that constellation. We've got the arm beyond us, which is called the Perseus arm, because it goes through the constellation of Perseus. And beyond that, we think there is an outer arm, 
although all of this is very much conjecture, we're not absolutely sure about all this, what goes on over here is very little known. These names, by the way, are just one set of names. There are other authors who use other sets of names. Don't be confused if you see others in other magazines or books. Now, the trouble with seeing very far in our galaxy is that we've got a lot of this dark material, dust and gas from which stars are forming. This concentrates largely in the disk of our galaxy, which unfortunately is where we are as well. So this does tend to restrict our view. And if you take a wide-angle picture of the Milky Way, which is what we've got here, it looks very much like the sideways on picture of a galaxy, doesn't it? So here we've got the central region of the galaxy, and these dust lanes passing through the disk of the galaxy, obstructing our view. So much so that what lies in here is really not known at all. We saw in the previous talk that what was going on over here really wasn't understood. So if you happen to come from anywhere over there, well, hard luck, because we don't know what's going on. What has happened is that the author of this map has joined up the spiral arms to make it look reasonable, but we have no direct evidence that that is the case. So when we look at the galaxy like this, we see here the central regions of the galaxy, and we're looking there at the central bulge, aren't we? Uh, well... I don't know that we can be sure, because judging distances, which is what you need to do, is what you would have to do if you're going to find out where you're looking in the galaxy. So we need to know something about judging distances. How do we judge distances? Well, the standard way is to use parallax, where you look at a star in December, and you look at a star in June, and you see that it's shifted a bit. Just like your finger will shift if you blink from one eye to the other if you hold your finger up in front of your eyes. You're not going to do that in your back garden. Angles are measured in degrees, and if you remember from your school days, you have those degrees marked on the edge of your protractor. They're tiny, aren't they? Divide each of those degrees up into 60 bits, and you've now got a minute of arc. Divide each of those 60 bits up into 60 bits more, and you've now got an arc second. And the largest parallax, which is the closest star's parallax, is less than one second of arc. One second of arc is the angle which you would see if you looked at a 5p piece two and a half miles away. So you're not going to do that in your back gardens at night. Yes, we can do it with very sensitive telescopes. Nowadays it tends to be done by satellites. The Hipparchos satellite measured parallaxes out to about a thousand light years and the Gaia satellite is busy making parallax measurements out even further. And they hope that they'll be able to see the parallaxes of around a billion stars, which is half of 1% of all the stars in the galaxy. Right, so what can we do about that? We can use the method known as the standard candle. Here is Henrietta Leavitt, who discovered this method back in 1913. She found that there were various variable stars one which was the prototype of this sort of variable star was a star called Delta Cephei, and the star varied with brightness over a period of days, and if you draw a graph of brightness of the star against time, you get this typical sawtooth pattern, which is due to the star pulsating. And she found that the more luminous the Cephei was, the longer it took to pulsate. So if you can measure the period of a Cephei, you can work out from, this, from a graph its luminosity, and if you know how bright it looks, and you know how bright it really is, you can work out how far away it is. And this is a technique which is good enough to work out to some of the nearby galaxies. The Hubble telescope has measured distances well beyond our own local group. But it's not the sort of thing you're going to be able to do in your back garden at night, is it? We need another sort of star whose brightness we know, which we can use. And that would be the brightest stars in clusters. Now, this is nothing like as accurate as the Cepheid method, but it's a good method for using at night, where you can't sit down and watch stars for weeks and weeks to see how they vary. The brightest stars in galactic clusters, such as the Pleiades here, are bright enough that if the cluster is at less than about five to 600 light years, you will be able to see the individual stars with the unaided eye. Pleiades cluster is about 400 light years. The human eye 
has a pupil of about 7 millimeters in diameter when it's dark adapted. If you can't see the individual stars using your eye, try using a pair of binoculars, and if you have 15 by 70 binoculars, they will collect 100 times as much light as your eyes will, and that will let you see 10 times as far because of the inverse square law of light. Once again, look it up when you get home. So if you use 70 millimeter binoculars, you can see not up to 600 light years, but 6,000 light years, and this will let you know whether what you're looking at is in our spiral arm or beyond. So the Pleiades, just quite clearly visible to the unaided eye, 400 light years away, that's within the 600 light year limit. The Pricepe cluster, where you could just about make out individual stars with the unaided eye popping in and out of visibility, this is about 600 light years away. So now we've got an idea of where these things lie. They lie in our own little spiral arm in there. What happens when we look towards the centre of the galaxy? Well, that's what we see. We see, unfortunately not very well from Britain, we see what we think of as the central part of the galaxy, and we have the large Sagittarius star cloud there, and the small Sagittarius star cloud there, and various other, various other things scattered around. The galactic centre is there, invisible behind all the gas and dust, and there's actually quite a large cloud of gas and dust here, which obscures a fair bit of the centre of our galaxy. If that cloud of gas and dust wasn't there, that's about the size of the central bulge of our galaxy, which we cannot see. Except we can see a bit of it around here. The large Sagittarius star cloud, there it is, can you see here, you can't see any individual stars. So that's quite a long way away. And we think it's about 25,000 light, uh, 25, 20, 25, light years away on our side. But the small Sagittarius star cloud, there you can see individual stars on this picture. And that's because the cloud is not at the centre of the galaxy or even near to the centre of the galaxy. It's between us and the centre of the galaxy. We're looking through the Sagittarius arm at the centre beyond. And we can see these individual stars in that cloud. If we come still further to the east, we now come across another part of the cloud, which is well known. This is the Scutum star cloud, and there we're looking, we believe, at the inside, the outside edge of this spiral arm here. So we've been looking in that direction for the large Sagittarius star cloud. The small Sagittarius star cloud is in there, and here we're looking at the Scutum star cloud. And we can judge that by using our methods of judging distances. Now we're going to have to scale the towns down a bit because now we're going to need to magnify everything. If we look at this, this is part of Messier 8, which is the Lagoon Nebula. Where is that? Well, that lies more or less between us and the galactic centre. It's part of the Sagittarius arm inside our own spiral arm. And if we look at the Omega Nebula, which is Messier 17, that's a little bit further to the left. That's coming off of Ocean High Street. Further to the left still, we have Messier 11, which is the wild duck cluster, and that's actually between spiral arms, between our own Orion spur and the Sagittarius arm. It's a cluster which is old enough to have wandered out of the spiral arm in which it was born as the material rotates around the centre of the galaxy. So it was presumably born somewhere around here, and it's wandered out towards the Sagittarius arm. This dark rift, which is familiar to anyone who looks at the Milky Way in a summer's night, it goes right through the middle of the Milky Way, all the way from the galactic centre down here, which is in Sagittarius. Here we're going through uh, Ori uh, not Ori Aquila, through Cygnus to Cassiopeia. And this dark rift is a very long feature. And that, we believe, lies here on the inside of our own Orion Spur. And that covers up quite a lot of the Milky Way, which is beyond. As you go still further to the left, you come across the wonderful North American Nebula. Where's that? That's a star-forming region in our own spiral arm. And when the Kepler Space Telescope went to work, that was looking at loads of stars, 100,000 or so, in order to find out whether they've got any planets going around them. It looked along the inside of our spiral arm. It's fairly clear 
There's no gas and dust along there to speak of. <coughs> and you can see lots of stars because you're looking along the inside of the arm, so the stars are all sorts of different distances. And Kepler looked out to a distance of around 3,000 light years, which seems to be quite a long way until you realize that it's only just into Black Heath, really. So that's the Kepler search area. That's the part of the sky it looked at. Here's the dark rift. And you can see that it's looking inside the dark rift between Vega and Deneb. And there's plenty of stars there for you to look at. Coming further, still to the east, we come across the double cluster in Perseus. And that, now we've looked beyond our own spiral arm. There's an area here where the Milky Way is not quite as bright. And then we come to the double cluster in Perseus. We're now beginning to turn that way as we look around. And this is in the next spiral arm out, just until about 7,000 light years. Then we come to Messier 34. This is in Perseus, and that is a cluster which is closer than the double cluster in our own spiral arm. Then we come to the three clusters in Origo. This starts off with M36, M38, and M37. These lie just on the inside edge of the next spiral arm out. We're looking across the interarm distance through our own Orion spur. The Crab Nebula, which is a well-known supernova remnant, lies also in the next spiral arm out near Charlton. And here we have Messier 35, and this is a foreground cluster. In the background, we've got a more compact, compact cluster just in the same line of sight, but in practice those are in two different spiral arms. Here's Messier 35, our own spiral arm, the much more distant NGC 2158, which is quite easily visible if you look at Messier 35 with a small telescope. Well then of course we come to Orion, and there's plenty of features in Orion, but what in particular were Messier 42, which is the Orion Nebula, that lies in our own spiral arm, relatively close to the Sun, distance of only about 3,000 <coughs> light years, and as we go further still to the east, we come to Messier 41 in the constellation of Canis Major. That's down below Sirius, just about visible from our latitudes. But now, unfortunately, as we swing further, we're getting to things that we can't see from Britain, like, for example, the Inter Carinae Nebula. There it is. That's the close-up of it, taken by the Hubble telescope. This is at a distance of around 8,000 light years. And Inter Carinae, which erupted in the last century but one, it is hundreds, that was visible to the unaided eye, and it was in fact the second brightest star in the sky. So that was a really luminous star when it went bang. It hasn't exploded totally as a supernova. When it does, it's going to be very spectacular. In the southern sky, we have all sorts of beautiful constellations which we can't see from England. There we've got the Southern Cross. Here we've got Alpha and Beta Centauri. Over here we've got Carina. There's the Eta Carina Nebula. And they lie on the outside edge of the Sagittarius spiral arm, just in between us and the centre. There we've got the Southern Cross, and here's the Colsac Nebula, which lies just at the bottom left of the Southern Cross. I'm really putting these pictures in because they're pretty. <laughs> and that's a wonderful colour picture of the Southern Cross. I think you can get a poster of that. I've got one on my wall anyway. Yes, I think Amazing Sky is a good description of this. The southern sky really is beautiful, and there are many brilliant stars there of all sorts of interesting colours. One collection of stars which was seen by John Herschel when he went down to the Cape with his big telescope was a cluster of stars in the constellation of the Southern Cross, which he dubbed the Jewel Box, because it had stars in it of all different colours. And that also lies on the outside edge of the Sagittarius arm. So now we look at Scorpius, and you've got the giant Antares there, and the sting of Scorpius. We're back here to the galactic centre, and we have more or less done a complete circuit of the sky. But you realise just how small an area of the galaxy we've looked at. Really, it's not very much. So our galaxy is huge, and there's loads of it we don't know very much about at all. The title of the galaxy, the title of the talk, by the way, was taken from as Robin correctly surmised, the novel written by the great science fiction writer Isaac Asimov. 
The purpose of the talk is not that you learn where all these things are in London, but that now you know how to do it. Maybe you can go out and build a model of the galaxy in your own locality to get an idea of just how big the galaxy is. Remember, the nearest star to us, Alpha Centauri, is about one foot away. Asimov's book, The Stars Like Dust, was written, well, he was probably best known for writing robot books, wasn't he? And yet this is one book in a series of novels set in the far distant future, the future history of our galaxy. And in this future history, the galaxy is full of populated planets, absolutely teeming with them. But the inhabitants of all these planets are human. There are no aliens in Asimov's universe. The humans are very distant descendants of humans which in the distant past of the novel, but in perhaps our not too distant future, went out from the Earth to explore and colonize the galaxy. And I thought we'd just have a look to see how far we got towards that future on Asimov's. Well, in person, we haven't done very well. We've been to the moon. No one's been to the moon for the last 45 years. But our robot spacecraft have done rather better. We have now explored every planet in the solar system using robot spacecraft, but most of these spacecraft were sent to explore a particular planet, and so they either went into orbit around the planet, or they landed on the planet, or maybe they suffered some mishap on the way. But in any case, they did not leave our solar system, except for five. Five of our spacecraft have or are in the process of leaving the solar system. The two pioneer craft sent out in the 1970s, the two Voyagers sent out later, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, and more recently, New Horizons, which was sent to take pictures of Pluto, and those pictures achieved in 2015 are still coming back to us, and they're beautiful pictures. How far have we got? Well, of all these spacecraft, the record holder is Voyager <coughs> It has now reached a distance of around 130 astronomical units. The astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. How far is that on our model? About half a millimetre. So I think that what we can decide from this, that in our journey towards Asimov's envisaged future of the galaxy, we still have literally a very long way to go. Thank you very much, Tony, for a fantastic talk, which uh, I never sort of imagined the uh, galaxy and our neighbouring uh, part of the universe <laughs> plotted against the, the UK before, but it's quite a, a wonderful comparison to make in terms of scale. Um, are you able to take any... Yeah, questions. Have you got any questions? Please fire away. Yes, job. It's more a comment, really. If you go to the Oxford Solar System, you can go and see Proxima Centauri, but you have to go to Los Angeles to yes, see Yes, it's it. a long way, isn't it? And there's also two stars, one in the Falklands and one in New Zealand. That's right. So you can do a nice little world tour, mm. starting in Cape. Not on foot. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. It's a lovely educational tool um, to, to demonstrate distances. Um, I use similar things uh, myself, but something that I did specifically think of in that is that you, although you concentrate on London and showing how close all the stars are that we can see in the night sky, and yet we can also see the Andromeda galaxy, which is right up in Edinburgh by comparison, mm -hmm. that really makes uh, it quite uh, something to think about. Um, I also thought that uh, on the science fiction theme that uh, another line, uh, one that I use, is from Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which starts off, space is big, <laughs> and I'll leave you to the rest. <laughs> yes. I did my own scale of the universe a long time ago, and I saw if you draw a picture of the Milky Way on an A4 sheet, a picture of Andromeda on an A4 sheet, 
It's about 20 foot or 6 meters away. Mm. And during an average lifetime of, say, 80 years, light wouldn't even get through the thickness of a piece of newspaper. Mm. The newspaper is 3 feet thick. And on that scale, when I was working from St Albans, the edge of the visible universe is somewhere near East Row. Mm. And there's a point about um, the population of London. Uh, the way they, one way of working out the population is to look at the sewage. If <laughs> nobody <laughs> collects their own sewage and plants it in the garden as fertilizer, it all goes down to the sewage works. So if you measure the sewage going through the sewage work, divided by the average person's output, I'm told that the uh, population of Slough is pushing twice what the uh, census says it is. <laughs> I find that easy to believe, actually. <laughs> 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 There's a lady with a question over there, I thought. Did you have a question? <coughs> no? Any more questions? My, my model of the solar system when I was 11, I envisaged the sun. You can see the sun and the solar system and Alpha Centauri. If you had the sun and Pluto a millimetre apart, then you would be here, you'd be Alpha Centauri. Okay. Five metres away. Okay, up there. Since, since we're speculating, let's go in the opposite direction and, and think how um, sparsely populated our bodies are, matter is. You know, the fact that neutrinos can, can traverse the, the surface of the Earth, the, the, there's, there's big gaps between everything uh, in the opposite direction. Yeah, that, that analogy is obviously done by someone who's never travelled on the Jubilee line. <laughs> I can assure you that in the carriage I was in, there weren't very big gaps at all. At least he didn't feel that way. Okay, well, I'm lucky enough that I've seen both the Magellanic Clouds from the Southern Hemisphere, as some others of you have, and I can assure you that they are both far more attractive than... Harlow and Luton. I did live in Harlow, <coughs> so um, in, when I was a student. Um, and I had 30 years in, in living in Putney. And I've only just discovered today it's in the Perseus arm of the Milky Way. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you very much. But thank you again to Tony for a great talk.